Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Ooh, we made it! Do the boogaloo. I don't know what the boogaloo is, but just do it. Just do that thing. <laughs> <sighs> Next week it's the box trot. That's what we're going to do. Ooh, yeah. How do you do that? Just in your chair. It's got casters, so we can move around. Ah. <laughs> I might back into my dog. That would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> Hello to everybody in the chat land. Um, yeah, as we mentioned, several other folks have, have confirmed it is indeed rainy as heck. That's the official weather forecast, rainy as heck here. So, Wow. We have sunny as heck in uh, Arizona. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry what to rub else it is, in. What else is new? Yeah. I know, right? It's just another day. Yeah. It, it, tell me when the tell me when the man bites the dog there, Brent. That's the real news, right? <laughs> exactly. No kidding, gang. Yeah. And it might hey, gang. Speaking of Arizona, we have another Arizonian um, near the 101. I hear that's what I'm, I'm, I'm told. <laughs> uh, <laughs> joining us this week, we have uh, folks. We have Jess Almley with us. Jess, this is your first time joining us, so introduce yourself to the folks. Tell us a little bit about yourself. For sure. Yeah. And already now you hear that I, yes, I live in Phoenix area, but I'm from the Midwest, Minnesota, North Dakota. So that's why I said, yeah, for sure. That's how we started off. <laughs> and if you were in Canada, you just would have added an A. Yeah, for sure. Eh? Yep. For sure. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Get her done. Funny. Well, I've worked in learning and development HR type roles my entire career in some way or shape or form. My very first training job, I was a trainer at McDonald's in college. Wow. So not only was I the drive through queen, they loved mm -hmm. to put me there, but I got to start training people and I, I, I fell in love with it at that point. And then worked, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. So the new world of wearing headphones for, for your living, that, that just comes natural for you, right? It's, it's so comforting. <laughs> I'm so glad we've all, we've all gone to this now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you put them on and you get the sense of uh, hot apple pies wafting through the air and, and fries, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and can I get the you only, some fries with that? <laughs> the only difference is you don't feel greasy when you're done. With... <laughs> good, good. That was the worst part about that particular job. You just kind of went home feeling like you were coated in a layer. But... My first job was uh, was fast food too as well. And uh, so, yeah, I, I know that. You feeling, understand the... Yep. The layer of grease. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so I did that and then worked in corporate and in HR after graduating from college in a number of different roles and HR receptionist, HR coordinator, uh, training coordinator, orientation coordinator, and then moved my way up. Took a stint in the middle of my career in higher education, did hmm. student leadership development there, which was a really fun job, and then went moved back to corporate. So uh, recently left my last corporate position, which I was the vice president of learning experience for a employee benefits company. Mm -hmm. I worked for the company about eight years. I had that role for about five, moved up in that company once I started. And just recently, within the last two months, started my own gig doing consulting on my own. So oh, that's, cool. that's the snapshot. Mm -hmm. And I love, love, love crazy socks and coffee. Another not, crazy socks lover. I, I, there's another one of those in our industry. Not me, but oh. uh, there, there is another industry crazy socks person. Yes. <laughs> Secretly Googling. Who is it? <laughs> so here's the thing with crazy socks. So you can look very professional, but inside your shoes, you're silly. You're still fun. <laughs> See? Not, not going to lie. Confession. Um, 
my, my standard sock, and this is for the Canadians in the crowd here, my standard sock almost every day is um, a pair of Roots brand woolly socks. So semi-crazy. Crazy? Well, semi-crazy, they... right? Like, it, you know. Roots. <laughs> Lydia, Lydia agrees or understands. They don't have. Like like mine today are penguins going shopping. They don't have anything like that. Not that crazy, no. Okay. But uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Peter's referring to them as the Nipigon nylons. Yeah, that's <laughs> Nipigon being a, a place up here. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, I think um, that's one of the reasons I think why you landed on my radar, Jess, was when I uh, uh, I think I saw a post on LinkedIn. Uh, announcing your departure from your job and starting your own consulting gig. And one of the articles that you had written about or one, one thing you were talking about, I believe was having advisors and being con connecting the L&D department to the managers and to the, to the teams and to the organization in a better way. And I immediately knew I had to talk to you. <laughs> so... <laughs> I said, this is somebody who's lived the life, who's had to deal with all the things, and we definitely need to uh, to get her on the show and, and talk to her. So, so that's what we're talking about today. So um, how can L&D become a trusted business advisor? And man, oh man, everybody asks for a seat at the table. And everybody I, asks for it. Yeah, but sometimes be careful what you wish for, right? Uh, you know, if you're not ready for it. So I don't know, kick us off a little bit. And maybe just tell us kind of how that kind of became a t uh, an interesting topic for you or why you think it's important. Yeah, something that I'm pretty passionate about. So I think throughout my career, I've always been fascinated with there's got to be a better way. Like, we don't, there's got to be a better way to do this that will maximize what the learners get out of it and what the business or organization gets out of it and how we all advance together. And so I got pretty passionate about that earlier in my career in various ways. But when I started working, when I went back to corporate, so I've been in higher ed, when I went back to corporate, I realized what was happening with, with learning and development specifically was we were being asked for things and or delivering things that didn't solve problems. So we all want to help our organizations and solve their challenges, but what we were being asked to provide didn't actually solve the issue. And if we're providing something that doesn't solve the issue, we're wasting time, money, and resources for ourselves, our own teams, and the organization as a whole. So if we just say it, it and that that's the order taking, that's what we, yeah. we kind of tend to refer to it as here, give me a training. I give you a training and then it doesn't solve the problem. And now I'm as a stakeholder, I'm upset that it didn't solve the problem. And now I also could, I point the finger right back at you, the learning and development person for, I asked you for this training. Why isn't it solving my problem? Why didn't it Whoa, work? Wait, <laughs> we gotta, we gotta back up the bus here. <laughs> So um, I think throughout the years, what I realized was, first of all, strategy. Strategy is really important in our work and not enough of us work strategically. But secondly, I worked very hard in my last role to become a trusted business advisor and achieved that. And I saw the difference that it made when people were coming to us, our learning and development team, and saying, we need help solving this business challenge. What can we do? instead of we need this training so that shift happened over time mm -hmm. yeah well and, and you just used the word time uh, because trust is not something you can simply flick a switch on it's not like the sign in your door of trusted advisor <laughs> you know you can't just post it up there it's got to be earned over time so um you know when you were pursuing this in your last role were you starting out from sort of the standard e-learning or learning development team kind of position? And if so, what were some of the things that, that you did to actually earn that trust to, to, you know, shift the perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So the very first thing that I did, you know, having, having worked, first of all, in, in higher education and needing to work with a number of different faculty and faculty for anyone who's been in higher education is a whole different ball of wax. But getting faculty to work collaboratively and seeing the, the benefits of that 
made me think, wait a minute, there's something to this. How do we work collaboratively and build trusting relationships in a business? So when I started, I did what I called a air quotes learning tour. And I asked to meet with any and all leaders who were influential in the business at all different areas. And I sat down with them for 30 minutes each and I only asked them questions about them. It wasn't about me. You know, the questions were, uh, what's your business? What do you do? What's your department do? How are you successful? What's your cadence like? Uh, so your work cadence, in other words, do you have times in the year that are really busy for you and times that aren't as busy? What's most challenging? All of those questions, like kind of an interview. So I could, I could really understand the business that I was working within. So that was the first thing that I did. And I think that is important to create what I call respected relationships. You don't have to be someone's BFF in the organization, but you do have to have an, uh, a relationship of respect where I respect what you do, you respect what I do. And in some ways you wanna to get to the point where I'm the go-to for anything related to learning and you're the go-to for anything related to operations or claims or whatever that is. We need to be known to each other and create that. So that was the very first thing I did. And I still think that that was something that set me off on the right foot. Now, I think for those who are in organizations right now that have don't, they've been there for a while and they don't, they don't say, hey, I'm coming in new and now I need to do my learning tour. You can do it at any point. Mm -hmm. You can start having those conversations with people at any point to ask them more about their business and what they do and better understand it. So that was one thing yeah. I did. And how we can help, right? And so mm -hmm. you get all that information, right? And I mm -hmm. think some some people do get that. Then it becomes prioritizing, right? How do you then actually do the work, right? It, it's like, well, we've we've um, you know all these requests are coming in, and we have to do that work. But now we're also trying to meet the needs of all of these businesses. How do you balance the two, or how do you make the new one, the priority over the old stuff without, you know, upsetting people because people have historically this idea of what it is that L and D or training departments are supposed to do. Right. And it's like, if we don't, you know, do give them what they ask for, if, if we try to, you know, sort of flip the script on folks, that can be a little bit of a organizational disruption. <laughs> for sure. It can, if I, especially at the, at the beginning. And I think there's a fine line here of building influence across the organization. Sometimes when you're first working with a stakeholder, you say yes to that little request so that you can work with them, you know, and you can show that you can do good work, that kind of thing. It doesn't mean you don't ask the other questions, the questions to try to dive down deeper into what the root issue is. But it does mean that, you know, there, there's a, you don't push back so much that you say, I won't do that but you take a little bit so you can you can you can build that relationship over time and you can start ask building that trust and start asking more of those questions I and mean, in my experience once you do that there becomes a point at which those questions that you're asking about the root cause become expected and the pushback is expected as opposed to why aren't you doing this um because one of one of the things that i think we we as learning and development folks, we sabotage our own seat at the table. So yeah, we were sadly, talking right? about <laughs> wanting that seat, but we deliver on that training that they, they ask us to deliver on. I want a training on, on emotional intelligence. Okay, yeah, we can, we can do that. You know, we're eager to help mm -hmm. instead of asking more questions, but every, every time we just deliver an order, that just reinforces the narrative that that's what we're about. So that's how we have trained the business to work with us yeah. as order takers. We live in a space also uh, all too often of one and done. So you want an emotional intelligence training? Okay, I'll create that for you. Here you go. In fact, I've got something. But then there's nothing beyond that that creates that transformation. It's all transactional. Um, we yeah. do things like we change our mind all the time. So we we change our minds all the time so we're right now we're going to create a training on this oh no now we're going to treat create this now and there's no strategy that we stick to and train the business that there's a developmental strategy here it's not just the flavor of the month training yeah yeah um 
yeah, so those are a few of the ways that I think we we sabotage our own seat at the table because we reinforce the narrative and we're not showing people, we're not training the business how to work with us in a different way. Um, just back to your, your series of meetings because Rebecca has tossed something in the chat. Curious to know if Jess set expectations going into this meetings, these meetings that L&D may not be able to solve all of their department, departmental issues, but that it was an information gathering and learning meeting. And I got the sense too that you weren't, you were, this was, this was most more of, more of an introduction, get to know you as opposed to a, what do you need necessarily, you know, as, as a framework, if I understood. Yep, you doing absolutely. Kind of things, yeah. Yes, it had yeah. nothing to do with what do you need. I think I did ask the question, how do you work with training and learning right now mm. um, to better understand that? But the meetings were set up as this is a, I want to get to know you and what your team, your department, your organization does so that I can better understand your work. It was all sure. about you, not about me. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was about you learning the organization. So you, as, as opposed to there's a new sheriff in town and, and, and here's the rules, you know? Yeah. yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, that was not the purpose. And so, yes, Rebecca, that was set up front in the invites that this is the purpose for the meeting. I'd like 30 minutes to learn more about your organization or your part of the organization, what you do, how you're successful. I think I even sent a few key questions that I'd like to ask because some folks like to prepare ahead of time. Some don't, but that at least gave them the option. So yes. And then I would say the other thing with those meetings is they didn't stop after that initial meeting. So once I could identify in the organization who my key stakeholders were, the people who were most often I needed to work with in some way, shape or form, I had regular touch base meetings with them where we only talked about them for the most part. I mean, we would say, you know, have you, have you, how is that program going? How's learning going within your organization? But I would ask them the same types of questions, like what are your challenges right now? What are your goals? Because I believe that there's a two-part formula to creating a trusted business advisor relationship. And one of them is that relationship building. So getting to know that person and getting to know what they're all about. But the second part of that is understanding their business. So it's your own business knowledge. And you want both of those things. If you were to make a grid, you want both of those things to be high. So you want to have a great, a good respected relationship with that person and you want to understand their business so that you can make decisions as a learning and development person based on what would be best for them because you understand what it's like to sit in their seat and you understand the challenges that they face. You understand the pressures that they're under. <laughs> um, so not only would I do those, those meetings, but I would, I started asking them for their metrics. So every, every department across the, across any organization has to report on metrics. They have to report on how their business is doing with their performance KPIs and whatnot. I started asking if I can see those. Now the first, I remember one particularly difficult stakeholder when I asked her for that, I said, can I see your um, metrics? Can you, can you, can I get in, involved in that? She was like, why do you want that? You're just the training person. I don't get mm -hmm. why you want to see that. And she kind of gave it to me as a, all right, fine. Like, I'll put you on the list, but I don't expect you to even look at these. But I did look at them, reviewed them. And so then the next time I went to meet with her, and this became my pattern then, I had looked at her metrics and I had said, here's what I see. Can you tell me more about this particular project you're working on and why it's important? Can you tell me more about? And that is really for that particular stakeholder who was started off very difficult to work with. That became something that transformed our relationship because she, she felt like I was interested in her business and I cared about her business, not just mine. And she loved to talk about all the things that they were doing and working on. And then we could start this brainstorming together. What if, what if? So that was, that was fantastic. So I think those two things, and they're not things that you'll know right away to your point, Chris, trust is built over time. So most of us start not having a, a respected relationship and not knowing about the business, but those are the things we need to work on in order to become that trusted business advisor. Hmm. I think it's a much stronger relationship too, when you can overcome that initial um, I don't know, uh, uh, uncertainty with one of the business leaders. Like if they, if, 
if they if they're coming to you with a lot of skepticism, I guess is the word I'm looking for, right? And you're able to yeah. turn them or or they have this idea of you and maybe they even talk down to you and they're a little condescending. Um, mm -hmm. If you're able to spin that relationship and actually help them and get them to realize that you're there to help them, not force things on them, not take their people off away from the job to go to a training or whatever, but you're there to do everything you can to try to help them be better at what they're going to do. When you can turn that person, you have you've made a, a, a strong connection for life. In my experience, that's what I found. The ones who just, who, who, who yes you all day long when you go and you sit with them, those are the ones that you kind of have to look out for. But the ones that are very vocally against you from the start and turning them, those were always my favorites. Yes, mine too. <laughs> I mean, I can think of those in my, in my head, the ones who were the most challenging. And yet, and then when we did turn them, they became the most fruitful like we yeah. and doing the best work with those people it's almost like you had made an advocate for life yeah but i was gonna say yeah they start to advocate for the training department and they start talking about how important you are as opposed to yeah if things start to go bad yeah we could do without the training department we really you know <laughs> you, that's that's how we start to get there and we we've got some great questions and yeah i'm I hope I didn't interrupt in too bad of a spot here, but um, this is a quick one that might be fun to answer. Do you find that one of the problems for L&D in winning the trusted advisor role is that the L&D function is often organized as a part of the L or the HR organization? That is a fantastic question. Right. And I don't think it's easy to answer. I think it depends. I mean, it depends on the organization and it depends on the view of the HR department. So yes. Now, when I was in the vice president of learning role, I reported up through or up through operations. So it was a little bit mm. of a different reporting structure. And so I do think that allowed me to be closer, a bit easier. However, I don't think it's impossible to do in an HR function. I think you just need to be really intentional about Again, you're up against assumptions. You're up against what people see as the role of HR is shifting the mindset, which I feel like, Brent, is what we were just talking about is we're shifting yeah. the mindset of that particular stakeholder as to what it is that L&D does. We now have to shift a mindset maybe to what it is that L&D does and what it is that HR does. And some of the things that we can do outside of the sort of traditional in the box uh, stereotypes. Mm -hmm. but. I think it is possible. So I don't know. That's yeah. it, it can be tricky, but it also depends on on that organization and what their view of HR is. Yeah. Even the even the name of of the the standard name of a department such as learning and development mm -hmm. doesn't really it doesn't speak to the role that we actually, you know, can play. Flip that around to oh, we're the performance improvement and then oh, you know the value as opposed to a passive or Oh, learning. It's nice to learn. You, you know, it, it sounds, you know, fluffyish almost or whatever, like it's soft, right? It's not, it's not focused in that way, but if it's instead the performance improvement department, then, oh, right away, you're starting to think about metrics, uh, you know, KPIs and okay, let's let, you know, there's, that's the purpose. That's the value. That's what the thing, that's what that group needs to do. Absolutely. In fact, I, I mean, you kind of strike a nerve when you say we're the we're the soft, we're the nice to have. I had a a boss long time ago. I started using this phrase. I said, I don't do nice things. And she kind of chuckled. And I said, well, I'm a nice person, but I'm not going to do something because it's nice. I only want to do effective things. And there's a difference. And so I have learned the hard way, I would say, to measure first. So what I mean by that is before we even start anything, we're asking those questions about, well, what, what are the performance metrics you're trying to move? And we're designing around that. We're not designing around, boy, this would be a nice to have. And in fact, if someone comes to me with a nice to have, I really would challenge that the reason behind it, because nice to have is like, it's like the really expensive gift that you didn't know you wanted. And somebody gave you and you're like, oh, that was really nice. And you maybe use it for a little bit and then you put it on a shelf. And you'd leave it there. You It doesn't do you any good. It doesn't necessarily enhance your life in any way. It just was sort of nice. 
but we don't, that's not what we want to deliver as a uh, learning and development professionals. Yeah. Yeah, there was there was another question I'm going to scroll up to, and I because I um, uh, cricket spent a lot of time writing this in, in the chat, so I wanted to be sure to, to bring it up. Um, she so says I've been I've been at my org for ten years, and we don't have a learning department. I've been working hard to collaborate with other departments and establish my little two person team as the learning leaders. I've had traction with some, but not organizationally any advice for us when we don't have a budget or executive support for an actual department and i've presented models on how this department could look that's a tough situation i'd say very much I mean, I but think it's it, not uncommon I'll no add. it's not it's not i think it comes down to what are you trying to accomplish as learning leaders what does that mean and i know we can't necessarily have that conversation on here, but are you are you trying to are you trying to put onboarding some type of onboarding? Are you trying to do an entire org org overhaul of learning? So there, there's there's different things. My approach would always be to start small and show the value through metrics. So what's one thing you can do? that you know you're going to move the needle you've got metrics to back it up and then you can use those metrics in having the next conversation moving to a learning leader role when there isn't in learning and org development de learning development part department in an organization is not a small feat because obviously right now that organization has not set aside budgetary funds for a learning department and the most expensive thing any organization can spend money on is people. And so you're asking for something pretty big, especially in the current economic times, unless that organization is doing really well and has a lot of funds. But it's going to have to be a small build that includes both anecdotal. So I like to think of it as heart and head. So both anecdotal stories, but also some pretty, some pretty significant data as to how doing this particular role moves the needle in the organization and saves them money or makes them money. Um, one of the things that I started doing with all of our programs was we attach dollars to them. So whenever anything saves time, you can attach dollars to that. Time is money. So yeah. if you can attach that this saved X amount of time or made X amount of money for whatever reason for the people or cause this person to make X amount of additional sales, that is a way that executives will listen is through that money talk. <laughs> yeah, I think I think one somebody answered the question up above without even knowing it, I think is as, asking asking the question to, of the of the leadership, the business leaders, what keeps you up at night? Uh, right? And what 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 issues are you trying to solve? And every once in a while, I mean, obviously there's going to be a lot of them that that training isn't a solution for, right? It's not a knowledge gap. It's not a skills gap. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not something we can directly help with immediately. But every once in a while, when you're having those conversations and you ask that question, somewhere in that list of three to five things that a leader will rattle off will trigger something in your mind and go, oh, that's something that we can affect. And I think if you can, if you can find those little nuggets and you know and and help solve those problems and and wedge yourself in there i think and then at the at, at the at the end of it this was something that i had to learn early on in my career which you have to promote those things that you do when you're trying to build something like that from scratch that doesn't exist don't expect people to just know what's going on inside your head and know what you've done once you've identified this problem that an l d department can solve and then you go in and you solve it, you have to all of a sudden become a marketing professional and promote the heck out of it so people know that you did it and that it this is something that you'd like the company to have or build or you know and then I think people then the, then people I think will be able to start connecting those presentations that you've given cricket and um and then and and this problem that you solved they'll be like oh now i get what you're saying or what you presented on now i see that value so i hope that helps a little bit yeah i would add that that 
dad, that telling the story is very important, but that also now goes back to your relationships. So if you've built good respective yeah. relationships with your key stakeholders, those are the people you tell. And then they start to tell mm -hmm. other people. And then pretty soon people are coming to you. We had a situation where there was one stakeholder who was not really excited about working with us to make changes, liked the way that things were, even though they were very ineffective in my opinion, in terms of onboarding the folks. Um, and so we didn't start with her. We, we did a complete overhaul of all of our onboarding. And we, my advice is to always start, go where the energy is. So there was another area that was really excited about working with us. So we started with them and we gathered metrics around along the way. Now, when I'm having conversations with that stakeholder, I'm sneaking in, oh, you know, we were able to X move the needle. We were able to shorten call times in the call center by this much. We were able to get people on the phones. They were able to get into production this much faster. And they're reporting higher confidence because of these couple things. In context, I would bring it up. Like she would say some of these things were happening and I'd say, oh, you know, we were able to do that. And she's pretty soon one day she came to me and said, hey, you know, those things you talked about with working with our call center, is there any way you could do those things with us? And I'm thinking, you know, I asked you if we could start working on this once, <laughs> but until it was her idea, yeah. but it wasn't going to be her idea until I had the metrics saying there's another area of the company that's really doing awesome. And she was very competitive and didn't want to get less mm -hmm. left behind. So that was another way of, of, of sneaking in there. But metrics are really important in that regard. And then having those relationships, so you can start telling that story to other people who then start to jump on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever made the mistake of talking a lot of instructional design with business leaders? It, it, I did that early on in my career uh, and it took me a while to figure out that nobody cared. <laughs> nobody cares. Yeah. yeah. The the one lesson I learned is use their language, not yours yeah. when you're talking about it. So there was one business unit I went to and I, I, we, we had done this whole blended model and the, the last leg of the blend was to create some structured on the job training. And I went and said, you know, now here's the next piece. Let's, let's do structured on the job training. And they said, oh, we don't have time to do training. We can't, we can't, we can't do training. Okay. But they're already doing it. They're just calling it shadowing. <laughs> so next meeting I came back and I said, you know, I'm wondering if we could do a little bit of structured shadowing helping you to reorganize what it is that you're already doing so that it's more consistent and that people are getting what they need in order to, to once they get out of onboarding. And that was something they had asked me for. And they were like, oh, structured shadowing. Oh, that's a good idea. It's the exact same thing that I was talking <laughs> about before. I just started using their language and not ours. Yeah. So from then on, it became structured shadowing was a thing at our organization. Yeah. I mean, that whole their language versus ours um, you've mentioned metrics a few times and KPIs and those sorts of things. And what I don't think we've actually articulated out, you know, clearly as, as a, or explicitly is that those metrics and those KPIs that you're talking about, that's their metrics and KPI. It's not, yeah, it's not, not, not our L and D. It's not the number of people who took a course or the past scores uh, or, or those sorts of things that we usually have as kind of our standard data points. It's, it's the, the rest of the organization's metrics and KPIs that, that you're really looking to influence and, 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 and assist with. That is an excellent call out, Chris, hmm. because yes, it is. That is why the reason why I ask for the metrics from the stakeholders that I'm working with, because I want to know what their metrics are and how they want to move the needle, how they're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Not me. Um, the efficiency measures that you talked about. So the, how many are in the course, how long the course was, how all of those are important when it comes to, I think, making business decisions about your learning business. So for example, if nobody is participating in a certain course, why are we keeping it on the books? Mm -hmm. That's where those efficiency measures come into play, but they're not, they don't, they're not important to the rest of the business in terms of them making their business decisions about where it's important to spend their time. Yeah, for sure. Peter's mentioning in the chat, measurement demystified. Remember that episode several months ago? Yes, yes folks, we have talked about this. Uh, we've talked about, the, the well, these kinds of things come up in a lot of conversations. The fact that we often are, you know, order takers, 
Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and also the seat at the table. It's a, a very common thread so through so many of our conversations, no matter what the episode title really is, that we always seem to come back a lot of times back to this, yeah. to this piece of the equation. So, yeah. Yes, for sure. It's, a, it's definitely a, I think you could call it a trend in our learning and development, but I think it should have always been there. Well, it, yeah, a, a trend sounds like something, but it, it, this feels like, you know, we've been having this conversation on and off in idiotic here for five years now, you know, it, it, it's been coming up since the start. So it's not a trend so much as it's an ongoing struggle, maybe or something or, or a reality. Yeah. And I do think whoever mentioned measurement to mystify, that is one of my go to's. I took that book and um, revamped our entire measurement strategy based on that book, and it was really helpful. Um, I will say it is not a quick read. In fact, I had to do a, it, it came to me and I thought this looks a little bit like a textbook. So I reached out to my network and said, who will read this with me? Because if I don't have accountability partners, I will not get through it. And so that's how, yeah, not a quick read, says Peter. That's how I got through it. But then it did take a lot of brain power, but it worked and it was great. So I, I highly okay. recommend in terms of coming up with metrics and understanding how to use the metrics. Perfect. Very cool. Yeah, you know, when we when we started off this conversation today, we 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 briefly mentioned that you're now um, hanging a shingle and doing your own <laughs> consulting work. So let me give you just a minute or two. Tell us what uh, what kind of stuff your new consulting agency might be doing. Yeah. So I am all about how do we create or up level or revamp any type of a learning, training, leadership development program. So it's all around that strategy of everything that we've talked about today from the metrics to the marketing, to the what's really gonna work, what's gonna work for the business. And that is the type of work that I am starting to do now that's related to those pieces of, of overhauling, upskilling, whatever the up, up leveling that training program, learning program, leadership development program. Very cool. Um, yeah, I, I, a thought that I was having was uh, similar to that. Was that oh, you're on the outside now, so you know mm -hmm. how how does that work? But you're you're now here as a as an as an advisor or as a you know, an assistive agent in helping others achieve that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it it definitely is. Um, it's a different space to be in, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, to, to to seeing how your journey goes forward and uh and and if uh if anybody out there in uh in the chat or in the world listening to the podcast is uh you know needing some help or wanting to know if they can go further you guys can reach out to jess right can you drop your stuff in the chat yep there's my linkedin profile and i also do a bi-weekly newsletter called lnd must change because I believe we've got to keep moving our profession forward overall for sure. and we can get better. So I'll drop, I dropped a chat to a link to that directly as well. If you want to subscribe. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for that. Jess, this has been a fabulous conversation. It echoes with so many themes that we end up uh, having to, to discuss here on, on, and it's such a, um, such a, a constantly current topic of, of discussion that we have to keep focusing on in our space. Um, folks, I do want to flag that, uh, Hey, what we get to do here on Instructional Designers and Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino Learning Systems. If you happen to be listening to the audio version of today's session, you can check us out and learn more at domino.com. Um, and for those of you here in the chat as well, I'm just throwing a link in there uh, into the chat that uh, will take you over to the website too if you're interested in learning more about how we can help you in the game. There's a LinkedIn group as well. Don't forget to join that. Got it. Very cool. Jess, you thanks want. so much. Thanks, Jess. You were awesome. Thank today. you. Love it was with you. lovely to be here. Thanks, everyone. Great questions.